Let us pray. Father, with humble hearts, we come before you tonight, believing that you have something to tell us that we can only receive when we are humble, when we worship, when we adore, when we love you. And therefore, Lord, we come that you will write your words upon the table of our hearts in Jesus' name. Father, we are willing to receive, we are willing to hear, we are willing to live by the standard of your word. Therefore, Lord, we are asking that you will not hold anything back from us. You will teach us your truth, your word, in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind to our minds. Reveal your word in our lives. That, Lord, through these words, you will perfect us, that we may be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us tonight, O Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we're studying from Psalm 24. Already, we have selected some of the Psalms, and we have gone through, step by step, line upon line, looking at what the Lord intends for the church to learn today. And as we come to Psalm 24 today, I need to bring this to your notice that actually Psalms 22, 23, and 24 form a triplet that we cannot separate one from the other. What I mean is, Psalm 22 is talking about the same personality as Psalm 23 and Psalm 24 are talking about. Only this, that Psalm 22 concentrates upon a time in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 23, another time. Psalm 24, another time. What I mean is this, that Psalm 22 concentrates on Christ, a good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep. Psalm 23 talks about the great shepherd making provision, abundant provision for the sheep. Psalm 24 talks about the glorified risen Lord, the chief shepherd that is coming to take his own home and he will reign king of kings, lord of lords. Let's look at some verses of this psalm. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. If you are a Bible student, you recognize those are words that came out from Jesus Christ at the time he hung on the cross. You will remember that they were the words that climaxed his suffering, his betrayal, as eventually he was nailed to the cross. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the leaf. They shake the head saying, verse 8, He trusted on the Lord that he will deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. You will remember those were the words of the enemies of Christ, of the unbelievers and the doubters, as they snared the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It says in verse 13, They gaped upon me with their mouth, as a ravening and a roaring lion. And then in verse 16, For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare at me. No doubt. You know that as Psalm 22 was written, that the writer was looking forward in a prophetic way to the time when Jesus the Lord, when Jesus the Christ will die on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. In verse 18, they parted my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And verse 22 talks about that good shepherd and then in psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures 
he leadeth me beside the still waters. Here is now Christ our Lord, the shepherd, making provision for all his own. That whatever we need, he gave us his name. And he said, whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that your joy may be full. Which means then, when this great shepherd fulfills all our need, and then our joys are full, we can say, he is my all-sufficiency. He is the one that makes adequate, abundant provision for me as my shepherd. I will not lack, I shall not want. And then he talks about the resurrection of the soul. Talks about being led in the path of righteousness. Talks about is the ever-present Emmanuel, God with us, in the midst of danger, in the midst of problem, even in the valley of the shadow of death. This is the great shepherd that makes a table before the sheep in the presence of their enemies. He is the one that anoints our head with a cup running over. He is the one that makes goodness and mercy to follow after us all through the days of our lives. And he is the one that said, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I finish, I'll come again. So that where I am, ye may be also. And then we can say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But the psalm we're studying today is about the coming king. The psalm we're studying today is about the glory of that great savior and shepherd. And this is written about the chief shepherd. This psalm, some writers have said, was written. On the occasion when the ark of the Lord was brought to the tent that had been prepared for it on Mount Zion. They came with triumph, with celebration, with shouting and joy. When they brought the ark from the house of Obed-Edom. And he brought it to Jerusalem. And then they sang and they shouted the praise of the Lord. Although at that time there was a breach. There was a problem. And there was a punishment and divine discipline upon Uzzah because he touched the ark of the Lord. And eventually the ark was brought to its place. Even though we know that this Psalm 24 could have been written on such an occasion when the manifestation of the presence of Jehovah, the God of Israel, was brought to Zion, to Jerusalem. We know as we look at the content that the psalm is prophetic. It is a prophetic utterance about Christ's ascension after victory over death, over sin, and over the grave. This psalm, Psalm 24, is speaking about Christ's ultimate sovereignty and glory over all. Let's look at the content. Let's look at the verses. Verses 1 through to 10. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. These uh, verses talk about the Lord, the king, the king of glory, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And I've divided the psalm into three parts. Part one, reasons for worship. Part two, requirements of true worship. And part three, the reign of the worthy. You know, we sing and we get this out of Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb. 
and he is worthy to reign because in fact he will reign wherever there is sun. Let's go to point one. Reasons for worship. The reasons why we ought to worship God, honor God, reverence God, fear God, and adore his name is given in verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the floods. These two verses, brothers and sisters, talk about the power of God, the majesty of God, the greatness of God, the glory of God. And it is the reason why every child of God should honor him, worship him, adore him. It makes us to understand how small man is, how great God is. It makes us to understand how high the Almighty is, how low every human being is. It talks about God as the possessor of all things because he is the creator of all things. It says the earth is the Lord's. It says anywhere you go, whatever you see, anywhere you stand, whatever you handle, anywhere you may go, whatever you may know, it says everything belongs to the Lord. There is a divine ownership. And because everything belongs to the Lord, the wise heart, the wise soul, we praise the name of the Lord. We worship the name of the Lord, who is so great, who is so mighty, to have created all that we see and all that we have. In First Chronicles, chapter 29, and in verse 14, Who am I? And what is my people? That we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Notice, all things come of thee. Everything belongs to the Lord, and therefore it will be the height of selfishness. It will be the depth of self-centeredness. Not to offer what belongs to the Lord unto the Lord. It says because all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. It says we have nowhere we can glory. We have no place for pride. We have no place for boasting. In fact it says when I consider what you have done. When I consider what you have created. All I can say is who am I? It brings humility into the heart of the person that is very thoughtful that will think God has done everything God has made everything God has created everything who am I and that will lead you to bring your worship your adoration unto the Lord you know why some people do not want to worship the Lord they think they are so great and yet they do not know that what they have what has come into their hand compared with the whole earth is very small, insignificant, infinitesimal. When you consider the area of land you occupy, wherever you are, you have a house, you have land, you have an estate. When you compare the area of land you have compared with the whole earth, how small it is. When you compare it with the whole universe, how small it is. When you compare where you have gone, where you have traveled to, to everywhere that exists, you know how little you know. When you compare the money you have, the riches you have, the wealth you have, compared with everything there is in the whole world, you see how small everything is. When you compare your own kingdom, your own area of reigning and ruling, your own area of control with the whole universe, or the whole world, with the whole earth, and with the whole of heaven, you see how small and insignificant you are. That's why David said, Who am I? Rich people, wealthy people, educated people, knowledgeable people, enlightened people, civilized people, because of the pride of what they think they are. They do not want to worship God. They forget the whole earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof. And then this man said, Or oh, what is my people? Some people will not worship God. 
because they think look at my class look at my club look at my society look at my tribe look at my nation look at the people around me he says who am i and who is my people when you consider the greatness of god the majesty of god the glory of god the only thing you will do is to bring your worship unto the lord because david said in this place that they offered willingly and the reason they offered willingly is because they realized everything belongs unto the lord when you realize that you you will want to come and worship the lord in psalm 50 verse 10 and verse 11 for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field. They are mine. And you can see here that God is the possessor of all things. That's why I said there is a divine ownership about everything. Everything in the world, everything on earth. Even the ones in your possession ultimately belongs to God. Initially, originally it belonged to God. And God loaned them out to you so that he can take care of you so that he can take care of your family and so that through it all you will glorify him it says because every beast of the forest is mine every beast of the forest is mine so then god lays claim to everything everything that lives everything that breathes and the cattle upon a thousand hills it says it belongs to the lord then in verse 11 it says, I know all. I know this verse 11 is talking about knowing all the fowls, knowing all the beasts and all the animals, but it's applicable to everything. There is no branch of knowledge that God doesn't know. There is no area of intelligence or research that God doesn't know. There is no area of knowledge concerning earth, concerning the sky, concerning the moon, concerning the galaxies in heaven, concerning heaven itself that god doesn't know he knows all that is the reason we ought to worship him we ought to reverence him we ought to glorify and adore his name these are the reasons for worship the wise man the wise woman will take it to heart and worship in haggai chapter 2 verse 8 the silver is mine and the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. And the gold is mine. That's another way of saying. All the wealth in the world is mine. All the riches in the world. They all belong to God. And everything that money will buy or possess. Originally God made them. And because of that. He is the owner. By creation. He is the owner. He is the sovereign. He is the one that reigns. All belong to him. I've been talking about material things. About the things to see. And about the animal kingdom. And I've been reminding you. As we read these scriptures. That everything belongs to him. And therefore if God has favored you. To be able to have a part. Enjoy a part. Remember it is the creation of his hand. And because you are enjoying what belongs to him you ought to worship him always remember the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof not only that in deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 6 do ye thus requite the lord O foolish people and unwise is not he thy father that has bought thee has he not made thee and established thee Many times, if you are intelligent and if you are wise, you are grateful to your father and your mother that God used as instruments to bring you into this world. Many times, as you look at your father and your mother, you are so grateful that you become humble before them and you have no other language to speak to them except the language of respect, the language of honor, the language of reverence, the language of fear and trembling. Because they have been serviceable, instrumental to bringing you into this world. If you are so respectful to your parents, earthly parents, how about God who created you? Is he not thy father? 
Has he not brought you into this world? Did he not make you? If God didn't make you, if God didn't give you life, if God did not preserve your life, what could you be? Where would you be? Shouldn't you, because of that, worship him, honor him, and reverence him? Has he not established you? Are you established on the earth? Has he not done it? As, are you established in a family? Has he not done it? Are you established in a business? Has he not done it? Are you established among your colleagues when they have no place to stand? God has given you a place to stand. And now you can lay claim to some things that you can say belongs to you. Has he not done it? Has he not established you? If you know that he has established you, he has honored you, he has blessed you, don't you see? That is the reason to worship him and to serve him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Who maketh thee to differ from another? Or what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. Now ye are poor. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. I would to God ye did reign that we might also reign with you. Here Paul the apostle reminded, reminded the Corinthians. He said, whatever they had, even though they were established, they had spiritual things, they had material things that they could lay claim to, they had physical things. He said, have you not been given by the Lord? And if you have been given by the Lord, shouldn't you honor him and worship him and give him the special place that belongs to him because he has given you all these things? In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. It says, it is not only the gold and the silver. It is not only the ocean, the rivers and the seas and the dry land. It is not only the stars and the moon and the sun and the galaxies in the heavens. It is not only the depths of the sea and the fish and the fowl in the air. He says, even your soul, that you belong to him, as the soul of the Father is mine, so also the soul of the Son is mine. What a reason then we have, that we should worship him. These are reasons why we ought to worship. In Romans chapter 14, verse 8. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Whether we live therefore or we die, we are the Lord's. That means then, that because we belong to the Lord, He has given us everything that we can lay claim to. Because we are his offspring we ought to worship him and we ought to honor him and as we worship him we need to know how do we worship him well briefly it means very simply to bend the knee before the king to bow before the king to surrender before the god of heaven as a king of kings and to give yourself completely unto him Therefore, if you are really going to worship in spirit and in truth, it will take, number one, that you give your heart unto the Lord. You see the average man, the natural man, the churchgoer, the nominal Christian, or the man of another religion does not serve God. He serves himself. He exalts himself. He worships himself. He adores himself. He glories himself. But the Lord is saying, you didn't create yourself. You didn't make yourself. Why not honor me rather than honoring self? Why not live for me rather than living for self? Why not devote yourself to my worship rather than worshiping yourself as a creature rather than the creator? If you are going to worship God, number one, you give the Lord your heart. You've been given to sin, living as a sinner. You have been given to self, living for selfish ends, selfish purpose. 
you have been given to the devil, to Satan, living for Satan, living for the will of Satan. But now he says, turn away from sin. Deliver yourself from Satan. Turn away from self and worship the Lord Almighty. Why should you worship him? Because you belong to him. Because he made you. Because he made all the earth, the air you breathe. The land you walk, the place you rest upon, the place you do your business. Everything belongs to the Lord Almighty. Worship the Lord, give your heart to the Lord. My son, my creature, give me your heart. Give me your heart and tell him that you know you've been living a selfish to a selfish end. You've been living in sin. You have been far away from the Lord. Your sins have separated between you and the Lord. Now you come. And it says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Call upon his name and say, Lord, I know that I'm a wretched sinner. I know that I have not lived the way I should live. I go to church, but I know I've been living for sin, living for self and following Satan. But now I come, Lord, I come. Not only that, if you are really going to worship the Lord, number two, you surrender your body unto the Lord. It says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies unto God a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You bring your body and you say, Lord, this is the body you formed. This is the body you created. I bring it to you in worship and adoration. When it says you bring your body to the Lord, it just means that you bring every part of your body unto the Lord. And you say, Lord, these signs have been serving myself and serving sin and serving men around me. Now these signs will serve you. These legs have been going wherever I wanted, anywhere I wanted to go. I went, whether it glorified you or not. But now I bring these legs to you. They will only go to places that will glorify you. Oh Lord, you see these hairs of mine. I've heard many things with my ears. Things that glorified human beings. Things that glorified the devil. And things that corrupted society. I bring my ears to you. They will honor you and worship you. See these eyes of mine. I bring them to you. Now is that just the idea of a preacher? No, not at all. You know what the Bible says? It says you bring members of your body to the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your legs, your hands, your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's why I said, if you are really going to worship God, if you are really going to glorify God, if you are really going to honor God, number one, bring him your heart and say, Lord, I come, I come, wash me, cleanse me, turn me away from my sin. Give me the grace to live a righteous life that my heart, my spirit, my soul will be given unto you. Number two, you give your body unto the Lord, all the members of your body to serve God, to honor him, to worship him. Number three, you see people say time is money. Time is life. You know how we calculate our life? You know how we measure our life? We measure our life by time. We say, how old are you? We say, how many years have you been spending on the face of the earth? We say, how many years will this new course take you? We say, this marriage you are planning, how long will it take? We say, this service we're going, how many hours are we going to spend there? We say, this new employment, how many hours will they take out of my life? We say, this new family setup, how will it readjust the way I spend my time? You see, we measure our life by our time. And if you are really going to serve the Lord and worship the Lord, you bring your time to the Lord. That's how to serve the Lord. You say, Lord, this is the very measure of my life, my time. I give unto the Lord. And that means that we will jealously guard that time so you can offer it unto the Lord. We cannot, serve, we cannot talk of serving God, worshipping God, honoring God when we keep all our time to ourselves. You see, as you are here tonight, you are giving part of your life to the Lord. Part of your time to the Lord is part of worship. 
You see, as we were here yesterday, if you attend church on Sunday, it is part of worshipping. You give your time to the Lord. That's why the people that are looking at time, they're looking at their wristwatch, every time they come to church, they're always in a hurry. They do not have a mind to serve the Lord, worship the Lord, honor the Lord. You see, they go to their places of work in the morning. They wake up so early, they try not to be late, and they spend about eight long hours. And even after spending eight long hours, some of those are workaholics, that is, those who are committed, addicted to work, they will take all the files and all the work from the office, they go back again, you know what they're still doing? They make their sitting room or they make their study room an office again. They continue to work. In the night they work, in the day they work, and they have no time for any other thing. They are worshipping their work. But when they come to church to spend one hour, they'll be looking at the wristwatch. Their mind is not set in them to worship the Lord. You see, if we're going to worship the Lord, you bring your time to the Lord. And you say, Lord, on Sunday, I have to serve you. I will have to dedicate and consecrate the whole of the Lord's day to the worship of the Lord. Number one, your heart. Number two, your body, members of your body. Number three, your time. Number four, your talent. You see, God has created every man and every woman with a measure of talent and gift and ability. God has given us a number of talents. The talent to speak. The talent of speech. You are able to communicate. What do you communicate? What do you say? What do you speak? Are you speaking the things that will help other people to worship God and glorify God? You have many, many talents. How many of your talents are you using for the Lord? Are you only using one out of five talents? Two out of five talents? Or only three out of five talents for the glory of God? You see a lot of the abilities you are using in your business. That's a talent we should be using for God. You see it, a lot of wisdom and intelligence you are using in society for politics. It is something we should be using for the Lord. You see it, a lot of your planning and strategy and the ability to say, we will we'll do this and do this and do that, that you are using in the world. Those are the things we need to use in worshipping God. You bring it to the Lord. You have ability to make strategy and make plans and speak and lead other people to a decision. We can use it for the Lord. Number one, your heart. Number two, your body. Number three, your time. Number four, your talent. Number five, your treasure. The things that you have. The money, the wealth, the riches that you have. That's what David said. He said, out of the abundance you have given unto us, our treasure, we have given unto you. And Jesus spoke about the people that are foolish. They lay all their treasure on the earth. Where moth does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But he says, lay up your treasure in heaven. Lay up your treasure in heaven where the moth will not corrupt and where the thief will not come in and steal. Use your money. Spend your money in glorifying God, in blessing people, in worshipping God, in doing things that will be to the glory of God. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and day that dwell therein. Because you and your property belong to the Lord, serve God. Because he gave you your body, glorify him with that body. Because he gave you all the time you are spending on the face of the earth, use that time, spend that time to the glory of God. Because he gave you the talent, spend all the talents, all the talents in the worship of the Lord. Because he gave you the treasure, make sure that you lavish it upon the Lord. Serve the Lord, worship him with all that he has given you. Look at verse 2, Psalm 24, verse 2. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. If you have studied some science, you will know that the greater part of what we call the earth is actually water. If you have studied science, you will know that the seas and the oceans stretch out thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles. And they are very, very deep. And actually the earth is very, very small in proportion to the ocean and to the seas. And this is what the psalmist is saying. He has founded it upon the seas. 
and established it upon the floods. You know, sometimes we have some of our little boys and little girls. They study little science and become so proud. They can't go to church anymore. They can't serve the Lord anymore. They say, you know, once you become a scientist, you cannot have time for serving God. That boy is ignorant. In any case, in secondary school, you are not a scientist. Even at the university, you are not a scientist. Even when you have got a PhD, you are not a scientist in the proper definition of the word. Therefore, it's a misuse of the word because you are studying little chemistry and little, uh, you know, uh, biology and uh, home science and home economics and all these things. You say now, I am a scientist. Never say that again. You are just a secondary school boy. And you know, sometimes some of these university uh, fellows, uh, because we teach them a little physics and they know some little formulas and they can join this and that and make a spark and make electricity to flow in the wire. They say, you know now, I don't have time for church now. I am scientist. No, you are just an undergraduate, not a scientist yet. You see, if you really know science, you will glorify God. You know, my brother, my sister, all that the people who study science, all they are doing is that they look at water, they give it a name, and they look at the components, and, you know, they call it by a particular thing. It's not that they are creating the water. They just say, here is water, and they begin to play with it and begin to say some things about it. You take a leaf. Not that they cannot create a plant. They cannot make a leaf. All they do is to tear the leaf apart and begin to say, there is something here, there is something here. All you do is that you look at man and you look at the anatomy of man and say they call this hand, they call this vein, they call this uh, this and they call this that. Not that you can make or create the blood. You cannot even create a mosquito. You can only kill a mosquito. You can kill it, you cannot make it. And therefore, you should not say because, you know, I know so much science. I know that there is fish in the water. I know that too. I know there are birds flying in the air. I know that too. I know there is sun in the sky. I know that too. You know, everything we know, God has made everything. All that you can do is study it. All that you can do is recognize the place it is. You see, if you really want to be scientific, study the Bible. And there is a lot of it in the Bible. Look at this verse too. For he, the almighty God, has founded it upon the seas. He has established it upon the floors. And because of this great power of the almighty God, because of the greatness of this God, we should worship him, we should serve him. You see what the psalmist is doing? He's telling us the object of true worship. And he's telling us that we are to worship God because he has universal sovereignty. He says all the substance and all the subjects on earth belong to the Lord. Well, foreshadowed in all this is the claim of the gospel on every creature, everywhere and for all time. Not only that God made the earth and them that dwell therein, he has also redeemed each. Therefore, the whole world and the earth belongs to the Lord by double right. One, the right of creation. And two, the right of recreation, the right of redemption, the right of purchase. Let's go to point two. Requirements of true worship. Now that we know why we need to worship God, He is all in all and we are insignificant. He is high, we are low. He possesses all things. What we have almost amounts to nothing. And He is great and we are small. He is eternal and we are temporal. He has been from the ages. We are just from yesterday or yesteryears. Because of that, we need to worship Him. But what are the elements of true worship? What are the qualifications of true worshippers? What are the requirements of true worship? We see that from verses 3 to 6. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. If we are going to worship God, here are the qualifications. Here are the characteristics. Here are the requirements. It says, number one, we will be of clean hands. And then we will be of a pure heart. And then number three, you will not lift your soul up unto vanity. Let us look at Psalm 15 from verse 1. 
Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Before you understand the interpretation of that, look at chapter 14 of Psalms. Verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. So that means all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A man may be a churchgoer. A woman may be a religious lady. But then that doesn't mean that you can worship God without being born again. Because it says they are all corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. How then will you walk uprightly, walk righteousness, and speak the truth in your heart? There is only one way. You come to the Lord, ask him for mercy, ask him for pardon. You say, Lord, I want to be saved. I know I'm a sinner. I know that I've done evil. I know that the works of my hand are corrupt and abominable. I need to be born again. And then you behold the lamp of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. And you give yourself unto him. You call upon his name after repenting of your sin. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you are born again. After you are born again, now you have the ability. Because God gives you the grace to now walk uprightly. And to walk righteousness. And to speak the truth in your heart. Remember, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And it says, who shall dwell with him, shall stand in his holy place. And now the answer is, have a clean, have clean hands and a pure heart. Then in verse 3 of Psalm 15, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, he does not associate with evil people. It does not associate with sinners. And then it says, He honoreth them that fear the Lord. Move with the wise, walk with the wise, live with the wise, and thou shalt be wise. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. That means, he says, Lord, I will forever give myself to you. Now persecution may come after that, he will not change. It says, Lord, I will not go in the way of the world anymore. People may make jest of him after that. He does not worry. He will not change. It says, Lord, for the rest of my life, I will worship you in the beauty of holiness. The worldly people may make fun of him or make fun of her. He, she will not change. He that swears to his own heart and changeth not, he putteth not his money to usury, nor taketh up reward against the innocent. He that doeth this sin shall never be moved. Look at these verses again. Is it possible to have verses 2 to 5 in your life, in my life, without consecrating your hands to the Lord? You have to consecrate your hands to the Lord because you can work, before you can work, righteousness. Before you will not hold on lawful gain. Before you will not have covetousness and have reward against the innocent, you have to make a consecration that my hands are committed to the Lord to worship the Lord. Can you walk uprightly without consecrating and committing your legs to the Lord? Can you speak the truth in your heart without consecrating your tongue and your mouth to the Lord? In verse 3, he backbiteth not with his tongue. If you do not make a consecration and commitment, say, Lord, this is my tongue. Now that I'm born again, I consecrate it to you. Will you be able to do that? And then in whose size a vile person is contemned. Without making up your mind that my time, my life, my treasure will be spent to the glory of God. That will not be possible. In Isaiah chapter 33. And in verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppression. That shaketh his hands from holding bribes. You see that Christian policeman that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. You see that Christian customs man that shaketh his hands from holding of bribe. You see that secretary. Now they tell you, secretary, they say, please uh, give this money to Oga. 
Oh, you say, I'm sorry, I'm a born again Christian. I have consecrated my hand to the Lord that my hand will not hold bribe. Or maybe you are a wife and uh, you know some of these uh, people that are looking for contract from your husband, they know your house and they say, uh, please, uh, when Oga comes back from office, help me give this to Oga. You say, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian woman. We don't do that in our family here. Meet him in the office. I don't take bribe and I don't hold it. I don't pass it on from somebody to another person. It says that shaketh his hands from holding up bribes. You will not give it. You will not pass it. You will not take it. And it says, Stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. And shutteth his ears from seeing evil. You see, this is why I told you that if we are going to worship the Lord, we will consecrate and dedicate our ears and our eyes unto the Lord. Stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. You see, sometimes you are going on the side of the road and some of these people that are selling things on the side of the road, there are some of these uh, cases they are selling. And it has bad, evil, corrupting songs and messages therein. And if you are a Christian, a child of God, you stop your ears from hearing those evil things. You know, sometimes even over the radio, you hear some of these uh, things that are uh, connected with idol worship. Connected with all the festivals of idolatry. And if you are a Christian, you will stop your ears from hearing. I'm sure you know that, you know, all these announcements about cigarette, about alcohol, about evil, about immorality. If you are a Christian, you will tune up that radio that shutteth or stoppeth its ears from hearing of blood. You know, in our church here, we tell our members, we tell the people who really want to make heaven their home, we tell them that there's a lot of corruption, a lot of pollution, a lot of dirt, a lot of defilement coming out of the television. And they say, where is that in the Bible? It's in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 15. Shutteth his ears from seeing evil. If you read that, you cannot sit before that television box and be seeing all the evil, all the obscenity, all the pornography, all the bad, bad things that they are bringing out of the television. And you are just sucking it in and looking at it and it is corrupting your heart, corrupting your family, corrupting your children. If you really want to worship God in spirit and truth, you shut your eyes from seeing evil. Verse 16, it shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. And thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far. He's talking about requirements of true worship. The qualifications of true worshippers. The characteristics of those who are worshipping God in spirit and in truth. First Peter chapter 4 from verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. That's the requirement to worship God in spirit and in truth. You will not suffer as a murderer. Now lady, if uh, you are pregnant and then you have gone to take some chemicals... And now you are having stomach problem and you are suffering and you are bleeding because you are trying to commit abortion. You know what is happening to you? You are suffering not as a Christian. You are suffering as a murderer. You are suffering as a killer. As somebody committing abortion. You know if you have killed other people either with charm or with evil spirit. And now there is a lot of calamity in your life. And you say you are giving your life to the Lord. You are not suffering as a Christian. You are suffering as a murderer. If you are taking part in killing other people, destroying other people and taking their property, and now they, you have a case in the court, or maybe you are going to jail and they are going to sentence you, you know you are not suffering as a Christian, you are suffering as a murderer. And it says, if we are going to serve God and worship God, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. If you say you are a Christian, if you say you know the Lord, here is the requirement to worship God. The requirements of true worshippers, you will not suffer as a thief. Whatever does not belong to you, you will not touch it, you will not take it. And then it says, you will not suffer as an evil doer. An evil doer. You will make sure that you commit your life to righteousness and to the goodness of the Lord. 
And then it says, or oh, as a busy body in other men's matters. You know, there are a lot of people, they poke nose into other people's affairs. And, you know, sometimes they don't look at their own lives. They look at the lives of other people. Ah, they say, look at uh, Madam so-and-so. Look at Mrs. so-and-so. Look at Miss uh, so-and-so. She has already got eight children. And she is pregnant again. What's your business in that? Are you the midwife that is going to deliver her? Are you the gynecologist that is going to deal with her? What's your business? In the fact that she, she has got eight children and she has got pregnant again. Recently, I, I saw uh, somebody that had already got 15 children. But that's not my business. I have not got up, up to 15 children. And uh, it's none of my business that she got 15 children. And it's none of your business. Why do you poke nose into the family affairs of other people? If you poke nose and you are suffering, you are not suffering as a Christian, you are suffering as a busy body in other men's matters. And you know, there are some people, they go from house fellowship to house fellowship, and they say, have you heard? Have you seen? That so and so now, they are in courtship together. What's your business about that? Are you jealous? No, I'm not jealous. Then keep quiet if you are not jealous. Are you envious? No, it doesn't bother me. Why are you talking about it if it doesn't bother you? Why is it the conversation every day now? Every time you know we come to church and you tap the fellow, that's the person I'm talking about. They are in courtship now. Busybody in other men's matters. You know, there are people that, uh, you know, they will not leave, they will not do their work in the church. They will be prognosing. Now the usher has nothing to comment about the choir. You are an usher, leave the choir alone. Don't be a busy body in other men's matters. If you, are, if you are a member of the choir, it is none of your business what is going on in the, among the ushers. And you say, you say, I saw one usher and you know he spoke to another person. What's your business in that? Do not be a busy body in other men's matters. And you know sometimes... Uh, there are some people in the zone. There is a local church, another denomination. It's not deeper life. And you are deeper life. And there's that church location in your zone, in your area. And then you are talking about it. You know, uh, there is one lady there. That lady is doing this. That lady is doing that. I know a member of their choir. I know one of their ministers there. I know a lay reader there. I know a church warden there. I know their uh, deacon there. This is what is happening in that church. What's your business in that? Do not be a busy body in other men's matters. You know, sometimes in the church here I see some busy bodies in the church, in our own church here. You know, there are some things that are uniquely, peculiarly the responsibility of the pastor and the pastor alone. That no other person should poke nose, don't put your nose, don't put your mouth, don't put your leg, don't put your eye in it. You know, and to decide what we study on Monday. Don't put your nose there. Don't put your eye there. Don't put your leg there. If you put your leg there, I'll match your leg. Because, you know, I'm the one that decides what we are to study on Monday. And you know, I'm to decide what we are to preach on on Sunday. Don't put your leg there. Don't put your nose there. Don't put nose. And there are some things that are just the pastor's responsibility. That nobody, nobody, anywhere, whether here or outside, has right to put his nose or his ears or his mouth or his uh, eyes or his leg there. Because it says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busy body in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf, for the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it must begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You see, brothers and sisters, it's a high standard. It takes a high standard before we can get to heaven. That's why it says, if the righteous castly be saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? It will take holiness, righteousness, purity of heart, and cleanness of hand before we'll be able to worship God in spirit and in truth 
before we can get to heaven. Let's go back to Psalm 24. And we say the reign of the worthy. From verse 7. Lift up your heads, so ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. I told you that many years before uh, the end of the Old Testament, that the children of Israel with their king David brought the ark of the covenant to the land, uh, to Jerusalem. And as they were coming into Jerusalem with joy and singing, with the sounding of the trumpet and with the sacrifices of the animals. As they were coming in, because they were so full of joy, because you see that ark is the manifestation of the glory of God for them. You see that ark, it was a representation of the very presence of the Jehovah God of Israel for them. Because of that, when it came to Jerusalem, they were very, very happy. And as they were coming, every step, they were blowing the trumpet and singing aloud. They were saying, lift up, lift up your heads, so ye gates. They wanted the gates of Jerusalem to swing open. So that they will be able to enter in with the ark of the covenant. And then they said, be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory, the manifestation of the king, the presence of the king, the symbolism of the king of Israel, of the God of Israel may come in. That's how they shouted triumphantly in the Old Testament. As they brought the ark into the Zion, Mount Zion. But you remember, there was another time in the New Testament. When Jesus sat upon the colt of an ass and he entered into Jerusalem triumphantly. And spiritually, this is the time when the king, the coming king, when the king, the king of glory, will enter into the midst of his people. And the children cried, Hosanna to the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. He entered triumphantly. And when the Pharisees complained about it, Jesus said, Have you never read? Have you never heard that he has ordained praise in the mouth of the children? And he said, Even if these are quiet, the stones will immediately rise up and they will begin to shout and cry the glory of the Lord. And yet, even though it took place once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament, there is a time that is still to come when the heavens will open, when every gate will open, and when God, when Christ will come in triumphantly. Because Jesus Christ is the King of kings and is the Lord of lords and is worthy to take our honor. Is worthy to take the riches and the power and the wisdom and the strength and the glory and the blessing. Is worthy of adoration and worship. In Revelation chapter 5, from verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I sing blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the poor beasts said amen and the four and the twenty elders fell down worshiped him that liveth forever and ever a time is coming when christ will come triumphantly when christ will rule and reign when christ will be the king of kings and the lord of lords we're told in revelation chapter 17 verse 14 these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of lords. The Lamb that shall overcome them is the Lord of lords. And that Lamb is the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I pray that as the Lord has called you, you'll be faithful, you'll be chosen in Jesus' name. And as we are waiting for the time, when all the kingdoms of the earth will become the kingdoms of our Lord and the kingdom of his Christ. Let us know that even today, it is necessary that we open the gate and open the door for Christ to come in. A time is coming when Jesus will reign and he will be the only king. 
He will reign upon this earth. All kingdoms will belong to him. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and in verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this world eventually will belong to our Christ, to our Savior, to our Lord, and it will reign forever and ever. But before that time, he wants to reign in your heart. And he's standing at the door of your heart. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Lift up your head, so ye gaze. And be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. I told you, it was fulfilled in the Old Testament when he brought in the ark. It was fulfilled partially in the New Testament as Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem. And I told you in the future, it is going to happen when Jesus will be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But today, it must happen in your own life. It must happen in your own heart. And therefore, the Lord is calling upon you. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Why then not? Lift up your head so ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Let the King of Glory come in today. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. If you will allow this King of Glory, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to come into your heart today, He will fight the battles of life for you. He will overcome for you. Because He is strong and mighty. Verse 9, Lift up your head so ye gaze, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of Glory come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. That's why the Lord is telling you, Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, open the door, open the door, I will come into him, and sup with him, and he with me. That means if you have not been born again, Christ is not living in your heart. It's not controlling your life. It's not directing your steps. You are not living by the precepts and the principles of the sermon of Christ, the sermon on the mount. You are not living by the word of God. You are still out there serving the devil, serving yourself, and serving sin. It says, I'm standing at the door of your heart. Open the door of your heart to the Lord and let him come in. When he comes in, then we say you are born again. Your name will be written in the book of life. And then when he comes in, he doesn't want ju just want to stay in your life. He wants to reign in your life. Do you know there are some people, they are born again. But they are not sanctified. There is something in their heart that is called the Adamic nature. The root of sin. That is called the inbred sin. And the place that Adamic nature is occupying is the very center of your heart. And Jesus wants to move from the sitting room. Just sitting in the parlor of your heart. He wants to move in to that inner place. To that inner sanctuary. To that holy of holies. He wants to live in that place where the root of sin. And where the inbred sin. Where the Adamic nature is living now. He wants to uproot it. He wants to take it away. He wants to circumcise your heart. So that as your heart is empty. He will see it upon the throne. And after you have been sanctified, you have lifted up the everlasting doors and the gates and the king of glory. The strong and the mighty one, he has entered in. You are saved, you are sanctified. He wants to welcome the Holy Ghost in. He doesn't really want to stay in your heart. He is telling you that the comforter, the abiding comforter is still coming. The indwelling spirit, the spirit of power. The spirit of supplication. The spirit of prayer. He also wants to come in and is saying, I have come in, you are born again. I have come in, you are, san you are sanctified. Now, let the Holy Spirit indwell you and fill you and saturate you and envelope you and come upon you and close you like a blanket. The Lord wants to come in in a greater measure, in a greater way than he has ever been before. Are you born again? Why not then press forward and be sanctified? Are you sanctified? Why not welcome in the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, and let him indwell and saturate you? Let's rise up. Open the door. Open the gate. Open the gate to him and let him come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Let the King of glory come in. 
if you have been saved but you have not been sanctified you have been saved you have not been sanctified that place where the adamic nature is that place where the root of sin is that place where the tendency to evil is that place where the inbred sin is is where jesus wants to live to come into the inner place into the holy of holies into the inner sanctuary let him come in if you have been sanctified let the holy ghost come in the comforter the comforter the power of the living god let him come in let him control you let him reign in your life let him lead in your life let him take every decision in your life open your heart open your mind open your spirit open the gates to the lord and say come and control me come and rule within me come and reign within me